When I first opened the yellow envelope that contained the journal of Alex Petrovich, my first thought was that it was a mistake or a joke. It was clearly an old journal, and as I flipped through its pages, I saw that it was filled with a small, cramped handwriting that I didn't recognize at first because of the words filling the spaces between the rows of faded blue lines. You see, the words were in Russian, and I didn't know any Russian. But as I paused and... It was an account of how the strange attacks near Pripyat had grown worse in the last few weeks and how this man, Alexei, was considering talking to his uncle in Kiev about them coming to live there, at least for a while. There was more, but it was lost in a growing haze of confusion and fear. These words, all in a language I shouldn't understand but was somehow able to read, looked like they were written in my handwriting. The journal had come without a return address or any kind of accompanying notes or explanation. It had just been pushed through my mail slot one day while I was at work. I asked my neighbors if they'd seen anyone leaving me an envelope, but no one had. I actually waited until the next day to try reading the journal again, my delay mainly born out of fear and reluctance at confirming that something so strange had come into my life. I half hoped when I picked up the journal again I'd be able to make any sense of it all. Instead, I began comfortably reading it from the first page. It seemed that Alexei had originally started the journal in October of 1984, after receiving the book as a gift from his mother. Like happens for so many people, the entry started out regular before quickly petering out to nothing as his interest waned. The first writings covered a period from when he got the journal until December of 1985, and that whole 14 months only amounted to seven entries, two of which he was sad and one of which he was drunk. It felt strange and somehow wrong reading this man's inner thoughts and feelings even though they were put down in such a sparse and perfunctory fashion. It wasn't as though he was bearing his soul that much, but I still felt uneasy when he started morosely talking about disappointing his father, who apparently had named him after an old Russian Tsarevich who was tortured and killed by his own father, according to the internet, or how he really liked this girl who had moved into town a few months earlier. It wasn't until January of 1986 that the entries started to grow more frequent, and there seemed to be several reasons for this. For one, he got engaged to that girl. For another, he got a promotion at his job. He was now the shift supervisor for the number three and four light water reactors at the power plant. The power plant was named Chernobyl. The third reason he was writing more was to document his growing concerns, not about the impending nuclear accident, of which he knew nothing from his perspective in time, but the strange attacks that had started near Perpiet recently. I could feel his fear and worry as I read his words. Four people had been killed, and Alexei believed the government was somehow involved. On January 21st, 1985, Alexei writes a long entry describing a story he heard from a co-worker and something he saw with his own eyes. Rather than try to paraphrase it, I have reproduced my best translation of this excerpt below. I've never known Luca to be a liar. A cheat at cards, yes, but not dishonest in things that matter. When he told me about the bowl of Pripyat, I know he wasn't lying. He was too afraid for it to be anything other than the truth. He said, as we all know, that there are certain work tunnels and other areas underneath portions of Pripyat. Some will say it's for a bomb shelter. Others say it's for certain important people to travel between the town and the plant. Lucas says it's for secret government things, the chief of which is the bowl of Pripyat. According to Luca, he had an older brother who worked on the plans for where to place the reactor in the nuclear city of Pripyat. The location was chosen because of something that was found there years earlier, in a cavern deep below. 
They called it the Bowl of Pripyat. It was a gigantic metallic bowl that stood as high as a tall man as wide as two Wartburg 353s were long. It appeared to be empty at first, but over time it was discovered that the bottom would sometimes fill with strange liquid. You could stir and shift the liquid, but attempting to remove any of it was somehow impossible, and anyone who touched the liquid seemed to go immediately and permanently insane. You would think this would cause people to stay away from the bowl, but as my father used to say, appetite comes with eating. The mystery and danger of the artifact caused it to become a highly prized commodity among those with power. The building of the plant and the city were the perfect cover as no one would pay attention to a few extra trucks or men coming in and out of the area in the dead of night. Lucas says that his brother never saw the bowl, but two of his workers had. They'd come back and told Lucas' brother strange tales of what was happening in that dark, deep cavern in the earth, and it was clear that they were terrified. The next day, his brother received notice that the two men had been transferred elsewhere, and he never heard from them again. The thought of all this was both scary and exciting, but at the time I had no intention of investigating it further. I'm no brain, but I know better than to poke a sleeping bear. Still, over the next few weeks, I would find my gaze wandering to a certain patch of woods as I passed by on my way to and from work. Out in a clearing, half a kilometer from the road, there was a large concrete pillar that ended in a heavy metal grate. I had always assumed it was some kind of ventilation for the tunnels underneath, but before Luca's story, it had always been a mild curiosity at best. Now it was imbued with a kind of weight that was both attractive and repulsive. Still, I stayed away. When the attacks started last month, my mind immediately went to the ball of Pripyat. This may seem foolish to some, while Pripyat only has small crimes usually, it is not unheard of for someone to be attacked or even killed. But this was different. One of the bodies I've seen myself and the others I've heard tell of, and the way they were burned and changed, it seems unnatural. People, good and sensible people, started talking about witchcraft and curses or possibly some kind of nav, but my mind went to the thing I'd come to believe lay beneath us. Tonight, when I was walking home, my eyes went to that patch of forest again. My feet froze to the spot as I saw something looking back at me. It was tall half again as tall as a large man, and even obscured by the trees and shadows, I could tell it had an unnatural shape unlike that of any person or animal I knew. It did not move, but simply watched me as I gathered up the courage to run back home as quickly as I could. Every step I ran, I expected to be my last. The thing would catch me from behind and drag me away. They would find my body as they had the others. Cracked, charred, bloated with bones that no longer seemed to fit together right. But nothing happened. I made it back home and have heard no sign of the creature in the hours since. I'm writing this not only to make a record, but to help me decide if I should talk to the others about it as well. I do not wish to be thought of as a fool, but I also do not want others getting hurt if what I know could help. I've talked to some of the other men in the village, and to my surprise, no one laughed. Others have seen and heard things themselves, it seems, and while none of us mentioned the rumors about the bowl or cavern, we all seem to be in agreement that some kind of monster is plaguing our woods. After some discussion, they have agreed to handle it without notifying any officials. 
They're forming a hunting party tonight and have asked me to go along. I'm not good with a rifle, but I will still go. I feel this is important and necessary to keep us all safe. There continue to be more entries after this, but they're usually short and typically detail their efforts to hunt this creature. Over the next two months, three more people are killed and the hunting party is going out every night with no success. And there's a brief paragraph that says that there was a citywide assembly held by government officials. The townsfolk were told to stop all hunting activities. And this was a government matter that was being investigated. Anyone found outside of town at night, aside from going to and from work at the plant, would risk arrest and punishment. The next one was the last entry written by Alexei and was done hastily, with the man's normally precise handwriting, so much like my own, being replaced with the slanting cursive I use when I'm in a rush. The date of the entry was April 27th, 1986, the day after the Chernobyl disaster. The plant is still burning. They say it started with Reactor 4. Everyone is afraid of getting sick from the radiation. Many people want to leave, but others say the radiation goes with the wind and we're safer here. I say that doesn't matter. Because the whole thing is a lie. Last week, we started the hunting party again. The military was doing nothing, and our people kept dying, so we resolved to act. Night before last, a group of us went on patrol, and for the first time, we found what we had been looking for. I wish now that we hadn't. The creature was standing over the body of a woman, though between her condition and the dark, I couldn't have said who it was, and in the commotion of the past two days, I still haven't learned. It looked up at us, in the glow of our lights, we saw it fully. God, but we saw it too well. It was tall and slender with a long, wide head that trailed off into thick ribbons of twitching flesh that seemed to move on their own. Coiling and writhing around its spindly arms and legs like puppet strings. Its torso was a ruined, misshapen mass of bone and meat with several openings that showed the black, glistening turmoil of its relentlessly churning insides. The worst parts were its eyes and skin, though for wholly different reasons. The skin, I would have to call its skin a kind of yellow, though it was strangely shining shade that seemed wrong somehow. Just looking at how it glowed in the light made my stomach quiver and something inside my head shift uneasily. As for its eyes, they looked almost human beyond their large size and light purple hue. They were intelligent eyes, eyes filled with knowledge and emotion. And it was looking at us with equal parts curiosity and contempt. We tried to fight it, but as it stepped forward, most of the men dropped their weapons and fell to the ground, jerking like they were in the throes of a fit. I felt my father's shotgun fall from my grasp, but I sank to my knees. I wanted to close my eyes to not watch this horrible thing approach and kill us, but I was transfixed. As the men around me grew more violent in their thrashings, I started to hear the first of several dull cracks as they broke their own backs and necks, one by one. As for me, the monster stopped in front of me and squatted down, studying me with what might have been mild amusement on a more human face. After a few moments, it sneaked out a speckled orange tongue and ran it up my face. As it finished, it spoke a single word. Salah. Either my revulsion and fear overcame its control over me or the creature chose to release me. Either way, I ran back to the town as quick as I could, and within two hours we were packed and ready to go to Kiev. 
invitation from my uncle or not. But that's when the soldiers came, telling us that there had been a fire at the plant and that no one was allowed to leave for the time being. I'm trying to keep a brave face for my wife to be my beautiful Elena, but I'm terrified. Afraid of the radiation if the fires are real, to be sure. But more afraid of the thing that this accident is meant to cover up. The thing that touched me and gave me these troubling thoughts and dreams. Because while I've slept little in the last two days, what sleep I've had has been strange and troubled. And I find my waking hours invaded by memories and thoughts that are not my own. Of a life that is not my own. In that life, I'm an American man named Brian, and it seems to be many years in the future. Young and successful, that life is easier in some ways and harder in others. I have a family there. A job, thoughts and dreams that are both alien to me and undeniably familiar. I cannot say for sure if I'm forgetting Alexi or remembering Brian, but either way it makes me both happy and terrified, as though I delight at the thought of being eradicated and made new. Perhaps it is radiation sickness, but I fear it is something worse. Some hex placed on me by that vile creature in the woods. I fear what its corruption might be doing to me. And God help me, I fear that it might stop. My name is Brian Favors. And I no longer think all of this is some strange coincidence or magical happenstance. I believe everything that Alexi wrote down. And I know he wasn't crazy. Or if he was, then so am I. Because I'm beginning to remember things too. Things from Alexi's life that were never in the journal. The look of mild surprise and pride on my father's face when I told him of my promotion. The smell of my sweet Alana's hair when I held her close. The feel of that rotten thing's tongue as it raked roughly up my face and somehow unmoored me and my counterpart from normal reality and time. I still remember being Bryant, but it's harder now. The memories of both men swim around each other like hungry fish vying for scraps of my attention. They shove and crowd each other until it's sometimes hard to see either clearly. I should think I'm just going crazy, but I don't think I am. And much like Alexi or Brian, in the journal, I don't know that I want it to stop. I write all this with the hope that it will clear my mind, at least somewhat. I post it with the hope that I can receive advice to what I should do next. I'm strongly considering traveling to the Ukraine. Pripyat has become a tourist attraction of all things, and while the trip will be costly... It may be that I can find answers there. But will the answers I find help ease my troubled mind or only give me more questions? For as my father always said, appetite comes with eating. I am Alexei Petrovich. I am Brian Favors. I believe that both of these things are true, that... I'm somehow both men. But I don't believe that this is the entire truth. I think the whole truth is that I'm both less and more than these men. As they travel this strange path that has led them to a creaking train ride across the Ukraine in a passenger compartment that smells of cigarette smoke and too many years of use, I feel a phantom a third trailing them. Us. Sometimes behind, sometimes ahead. But always, there is a terrible constant. The discordant beat of a corrupted heart. I can't see that third face yet, but I can sense it. It's pushing up from some darker depth, carrying the weight of the truth and the inertia of inevitability. It terrifies me for many reasons. 
most of all because I'm beginning to fear it may be my truest face. It took me nine hours to fly from New York to Kiev. For that, the longest flight I had ever taken had been to Arizona to visit my cousin when I was 19. This was a wholly different experience. The plane was larger, but also older, and while the passenger compartment was only half full, the seats seemed cramped for such a long flight. The blessing was that the trip was relatively quiet, and after a few minutes of listening to the low rumbling hum of the engines, I found myself drifting off to sleep. I'd gotten used to the strange dreams at that point, but the dream I had on that flight was different somehow. In it, I was in a town square, though I couldn't have said where. People were all around me, hurrying to and fro, ordering food from local stand, clustering up to have conversations here and there before moving on. I was looking around, trying to find some point of reference that might trigger some sense of familiarity in either Brian or Lexi's memories, but there was nothing. The architecture of the place was strange, and I saw no signs or engravings that gave any indication of a particular language or nationality. Just a large stone square bordered on all sides by buildings that towered over everything like the upreaching ornate fingers of some subterranean stone god. This was set against a sky that was a deep blue I would normally associate with twilight, but everything seemed too bright and well-defined for that. I could see far too much. And as the people crowding the square began to turn toward me, I could see the burn scars and calloids that traced fine lines of lightning across everyone's flesh. They were turning to me now, all of them. First with curiosity, and then with joyful recognition. A few of them came towards me, men and women reaching out to touch me as they echoed out greetings to a long-lost friend. At my sides, I felt my coat tugged as children turned their twisted and charred faces up to me with a gap-toothed smile and shining eyes wild with excitement. I tried to back away, but there was nowhere to go. The crush of people was growing now, and as they pressed closer, the babble of their greetings grew into an undulating wave of sound that somehow I understood, even as I felt it tightening my throat and hammering down into the center of my brain. They were welcoming me home. I saw several of the people further back struggling to reach me, rubbing and scratching at their heads in frustration that they were so far back in the swelling biomass that was closing in on me. A needle of new horror pushed through as I saw their hair was coming away in tufts, floating away like dandelion fluff as they went back to pawing their heads with one hand as they reached for me with the other. There was a man in front of me now, grabbing my lapels and grinning at me as he babbled that same flood of words that were neither English or Russian. He was saying how good it was to have me back at last. I had trouble understanding some of it, but not because I couldn't comprehend the words, whatever language it might be. It was because he was trying to talk as his teeth were falling out. I was awoken from a deep sleep by a concerned-looking stewardess. I'd somehow slept the rest of the way into Kiev and was the last passenger left on the plane. As I pushed my way further up into consciousness, I realized I was also soaking wet. It was sweat, for the most part, though I couldn't say for sure I hadn't peed on myself a little as well. Feeling a flush of confusion, fear, and embarrassment, I apologized to the stewardess and fumbled my way off the plane. I made the apology in Russian, but I was well past being troubled by such things now. Making my way through the airport, I found a taxi stand and got a ride to the hotel I'd booked prior to my flight. My train for Pripyat didn't leave until 6 in the morning, but between jet lag and worry, I got little rest during my stay at the hotel. 
By 3 a.m., I was already heading to the station in the cold rain that had settled over the city during the night. The train arrived a few minutes early, so by the time the sun was rising, I was already on my way to Propria. I woke with a start. My watch told me I'd been asleep for just over two hours. A dreamless sleep that was a blessing after so many bad nights. I still had several more hours to go before we would be inappropriate, so I started looking around with thoughts of exploring the train for food or a dining car. That's when I saw the faded yellow envelope laying in the seat next to me. I froze like I'd just woken up next to a rattlesnake. I knew what it was without opening it. The similarity of the envelope was part of it, that same old, dried-out looking paper that looked like it had been sitting somewhere for decades before it being delivered to me. But it was more than that. It was like I could sense or somehow dimly recall that there were two more writings inside. Forcing myself to pick up the envelope, I felt the shift of paper inside as I looked around the car for any sign of who might have left this while I slept. The only other passengers were a teenage couple that were looking at something on the girl's cell phone. Grasping the envelope tightly, I walked back to them, shifting my weight with the subtle sway of the rails as I went. They looked up at the same time, their expressions slightly frightened and wary as I asked them if they'd seen anyone leaving the envelope. The boy shook his head while the girl muttered, no, they'd not seen anything, and then they both went back to studying her phone. I wanted to ask more, but I could tell they were ignoring me out of some sort of anxiety, not rudeness, and I didn't want them to worry any more by being the strange man that kept bugging them with odd questions, so I reluctantly went back to my seat and opened up the envelope. I recognized our handwriting right away. The tone, however, was much different this time. It was describing events that took place several days after the last entry from Alexei, and this time the writer identified himself as Brian. Much like me, he had mixed memories of both men, and much like me, he found himself increasingly unable to distinguish one from the other as his nightmares grew more real and vivid. Unlike me, he had to watch as some of our friends were killed. Shortly after Alexei's entry, military came into town and began dividing people into groups. The first divide was between people that worked at the plant and those who didn't. Brian, still appearing to be Alexei to everyone else, was placed in the plant worker group. This group was then divided into those that had participated in hunting parties for the monster or otherwise made official reports of seeing strange things and those that hadn't. This wasn't said, of course, but Brian remembered enough of Alexei's life to figure it out quickly. Alexei and the rest of our group were interviewed extensively about what they'd done, seen, and heard. The interviews were conducted in what had been the mayor's house, but it had now been turned into a military post of some sort since the supposed meltdown had begun. Alexei, sensing the direction this was all going, minimized his knowledge and participation in the hunting parties and denied ever seeing or hearing anything strange himself. He was allowed to return home and see Alina. He described the strange love he felt for this girl that he had just met and the desperate fear growing in them that she needed to get away as soon as she could, even if it meant sneaking past the quarantine. She refused to leave him behind, however, and he worried that if he went with her, it would just guarantee that they would get caught, and she had every idea they weren't done with him yet. He was right. The next morning, they loaded him along with two dozen others into a bus and began heading toward the plant. When some of his co-workers asked about the radiation, one of the guards just chuckled, telling him that there was nothing to worry about. 
Brian wanted to ask more questions. How could radiation not be a problem? How could it be safe to go up there at all if the plant was still burning? But they had assault rifles, and he didn't want to test their good humor. Besides, he'd realized something as they were slowing to a stop at the gate of the plant. None of the guards were wearing radiation protection, either. The bus parked underground in Staff Lot B. We were all taken out of the bus and made to line up as a severe-looking officer approached. He said that we'd been chosen for a very important task. That all the details of the reactor accident had not been made public, and in fact, large portions of the plant were still operational. People who had been brought in to maintain the plant temporarily, but it was a short-term solution to a longer-term problem. They now needed us to go back and work for the next few weeks until a more permanent resolution was found. There were many confused looks and fearful murmurs at this. What the man was saying made little sense. If there truly had been a meltdown at Reactor 4, the proper protocols were to evacuate, stop any outlying fires or electrical issues from spreading to the core cooling systems of the other reactors, and then look at further containing and extinguishing the fire in Reactor 4. There would be no talk of running the other reactors normally at this point, or having more than the handful of crew needed to keep the emergency systems running so that there was no further problems during the full shutdown. But I recognized many of the men they'd brought because they were not only my friends and neighbors, but workers that I supervised on Reactor 4. At first, I thought they were going to have them help on one of the other reactors, but as we began dividing up, I saw they were being told to report to their normal stations. Without any special instructions or suits, not even respirators or potassium iodine tablets. Then they gathered the few of us left, the supervisors, together told us that they knew we had questions, but now was the time for action and loyalty, not questions or fear. We all nodded and held our tongues as we made our way into the plant. And as we went deeper, I kept waiting for the smell of smoke, the heat of fire, or worse yet, the metallic tang on my tongue that I've heard comes from radiation poisoning. But there was nothing. No signs of destruction or even disarray. I went through my rounds like I normally would, at checking with every station, and everything seemed to be in order. Not only in order, but still running. There had been no shutdown of Reactor 4. As far as I could tell, the control rods were still in their normal position, and there were no signs of a meltdown or any other incident. After a couple of hours, I snuck away long enough to look at some of the readings for the past few days. The logs for the past week were all gone. Aside from confirming my suspicions that none of this was what it seemed, it also troubled me for another reason. If they were going through all this trouble for secrecy, would they never actually let us go? The answer seemed dreadfully apparent, and over the next few days it only became more so. We weren't allowed to go back to Pripyat or leave the plants at all. It was justified as safety measures and security precautions, but by the third day several of the men had had enough. Many of us gathered in the dining hall, and three of the most vocal dissenters demanded that we all be released at once. After a brief consultation of who they were and how critical they were to running of the plant, two of the three were shot dead in front of us. The third, a nuclear engineer named Dusan, was taken away in handcuffs, and I never saw him again. It was that evening, as I lay in my cot during my three-hour shift break, that I realized what I must do. When I heard the tales of the tunnels between the plant and Pripyat, I'd always wondered where they might be hidden. When Luca told me of the bowl of Pripyat, my mind had turned to it again, but this time, backed by years of experience working at the plant and familiarizing myself with much of its layout. 
I never had access to all areas, but I knew of only a few places that were likely spots for such a tunnel to exist. I felt a rumble of nervous fear at the idea of trying to escape and being caught, but it was far outweighed by my terror at what might be happening to Lena every hour I was trapped there. I'd forgotten a letter opener the day before and had taken to carrying it in my pocket just in case I needed to make a makeshift weapon. Tapping my legs to ensure it was still there, I crept out of the hall and began making my way down to the lower levels. I'd assumed that I would encounter guards or some kind of resistance on these lower floors, particularly if there were a tunnel that needed to be kept secure. But oddly enough, there were none. Normally, this would have cemented my fears that I was on a fool's errand, but I'd been gripped by the strange certainty that the tunnel existed and I was on the path to it. It was in one of those sub-basements that I found a heavy metal door standing ajar. I saw no one, but there were splashes of fresh blood on the concrete floor nearby, which might have explained the lack of any guards. My breaths came in burning gasps as I approached the door, terrified by what might be waiting for me beyond it. But what choice did I have? I had to at least try. Pulling the door open further, I saw it led to a well-lit concrete tunnel that moved at a slight downward slope for several hundred feet before its path curved out of view. I saw no signs of guards or the monstrous thing that I had encountered in the woods. In fact, other than a few more splatters of blood inside this tunnel itself, it looked relatively benign. Glancing behind me a final time, I stepped into the tunnel and started making my way down. I walked for ten minutes before the tunnel started to change. I was deeper now, to be sure, but the rock was different here, too. Darker and with an oily sheen that I didn't like. There were still lights strung along as I went, but I found myself trying to avoid looking around any more than I had to. That's why when I rounded the next corner, I almost ran into another massive steel door. Like the last, this one was open. Pushing it further, I gazed into a large, massive chamber that was lit by large fire braziers rather than the electric lights from the tunnel. In fact, it almost felt as though the light from the tunnel barely reached the chamber at all. Pools of shadow lay across much of the large cave, with jagged rock formations and stabbing down from the darkness, like the closing maw of a wolf. Aside from the braziers, the only real source of light came from what lay in the middle of them. The bowl of Pripyat was much as Luca had described, or at least as I had pictured it. Despite my desperate need to get home, I found myself drawn to it and the silverly light that seemed to be pulsing from the inside like that of a beating heart. It looked to be made of some kind of metal, but It was then that a guard attacked me. He was already dying, but whatever had gotten his comrades hadn't finished him off completely. Whether he thought I was his attacker or he was just determined to do his duty to the end, he managed to drive a knife deep into my side. He was talking nonsense as he pushed his weight against me, saying, Stay away from the mirror. I fell against the side of the bowl, rolling my body away from him with enough force that he let go of the knife. Trying to fight off the cold shock I felt feeling the right side of my body, I dug for the letter opener. Once out, I held it up to fend off any further attack, but it wasn't necessary. The guard was already on the ground, his body contorting unnaturally as his bones snapped. The monster was here. I gripped the letter opener tighter, peering into the darkness as I felt my vision beginning to dim. My thoughts were growing stranger and more desperate as I felt my life leaving my body. I knew better than to remove the knife, but I had no way to stem the flow of blood around the blade. 
I would never make it to Pripyat. Never be able to help my sweet Alina. I would die here, alone in the dark, with this dead man and this terrible monster that had caused all of this calamity. Except, had it. And even if it had, hadn't it just helped me at least inadvertently? Knowing how pointless it would likely be, I found myself calling out into the darkness, asking the monster to help me. To help me get home to my Alina. There was no response, though I felt as though I could sense it out in the dark watching me as I clung to the bowl for support. In another moment, I would be too weak to even stand, and then it would be over. Turning away from the unhelpful darkness, I found myself staring into the glowing silverly liquid in the bottom of the bowl. I had the distant thought that either the bowl wasn't quite as tall as Luca had said or I had gotten taller. I almost laughed at the idea. And then I saw my reflection in the liquid. I looked strange. Something wasn't right. In my adult state, I found myself suddenly obsessed with seeing my reflection closer, trying to figure out what exactly had changed about me. Using strength I shouldn't have had, I pulled myself up on the lip of the bowl. The next moment, I was overbalanced and plunging face first into the shining depths that lay at its center. But I didn't hit the bottom or die from whatever that liquid might be. I may have gone mad, however, for I suddenly found myself lying on thick carpet in a darkened room. I barely had time to sit up when the lights of twin crystal chandeliers blazed to life overhead, and I saw there was a painfully thin woman wearing a business suit and a serious expression walking toward me from the edge of the room. She came within a few feet before stopping and giving what I supposed was her version of a warm smile. Looking down at me, she spoke English with a strange accent I didn't recognize. I understood the words well enough, though they made little sense to me at the time. Welcome to the Yamago Hotel, Alexi. I hope you enjoy your stay. The sensation of reading the journal of my twin self, this... Other mixture of Brian and Alexi was strange. It reminded me of finding something I'd written years earlier. It was unfamiliar until I read it, and then I remembered it again. As I sat on the train, trundling its way from Kiev to Pripyat, I remembered these events from another life as I read them. They shook me to my core. The smell of fear and uncertainty as we rode the bus up to the reactor. The terror of watching some of our co-workers being killed. The growing certainty that we would never be allowed to leave the plant once they were finished with us because we knew too much. The cold smell of the tunnel that led down deep into the earth where the bowl lay waiting in its cave like a coiled subterranean serpent. The sound of the guard's body being crumpled up like a piece of paper by the creature that lay in the shadows, apparently in an attempt to save my, Brian's, life. The touch of the liquid as I fell over the lip into the bottom of the bowl. And then nothing. As soon as this other me passed into the Imago Hotel, I had no further memories of what happened, even when I reread passages several times. The remainder of the account was relatively brief, and the brief postscript only made my sense of unease grow stronger as I put the pages back into the envelope. We were now nearing Pripria and the end of my journey, but I feel I should share with you that last account by the version of me that fell through the bowl of Pripia into that strange hotel ballroom. It may make the rest more understandable in some ways. The Imago Hotel, as I came to learn, was a very exclusive, very secluded hotel in the western part of America. 
I searched the memories of both Alexi and Brian, but neither had heard of it before. Then again, only a select few were ever allowed entry. The hotel was old and massive, with an air of elegance and wealth and history that was both wonderful and a little terrifying at the same time. Everything was in its place, and everything was beautiful, but too much so, if that makes sense. The spotless marble floors, the polished glow of the wood walls, and the artfully decorated coffered ceilings far overhead almost gave it the the spotless marble floors, the polished glow of the wood walls, and the artfully decorated coffered ceilings far overhead almost gave it the solemnity of a church, though a church for some unknown and alien god unseen in the minds of most. I'm sure this all sounds quite melodramatic, and I ask you for your forgiveness on that point. I know I will fail in describing this place properly, but I feel that I must try. And it should be noted that the oddness of the hotel only began with the decor. Far stranger were those that inhabited it. That's where I found myself in one of the smaller ballrooms of the hotel. I was greeted by the owner herself, Angelica Lamarck. She was a tall, very thin woman with bright, intelligent eyes and a kind of magnetism that made it easy to get lost in her voice when she was talking to you. If I hadn't already been so muddled from my journey through the bowl and my growing blood loss, I might have drowned in the soft roll of her words and the deep, raspy warmth with which she intoned them. But the pain where the knife had pierced me demanded attention, both from me and from a doctor. Showing remarkable strength, Angelica picked me up with seemingly little effort and carried me out of the ballroom and across a brightly lit lobby. As we moved into the open, several other men and women came walking up, their faces interested but unconcerned. She told two of them to get a wheelchair while directing a third to wake the doctor and prepare the clinic for their new guest. Even through the fog slowly filling my brain, I felt a stab of worry at this. What were they going to do to me in this strange place? How had I gotten here, and what did they mean to do? Then, I was gently sat in the chair, and Angelica wheeled me nimbly down several halls into a large space that wouldn't look out of place in the nicest hospitals in Moscow or America. An older man with a mustache stepped forward and introduced himself as Dr. Graham, before easing me out of the chair and onto a nearby metal table. I felt myself tensing again, but he patted my shoulder comfortably. He told me he understood that this was all very strange, but it would make more sense in time. For now. Now, they had to make sure I lived long enough that I got the chance to see everything. Three days later, I was back on my feet. Angelica had come by several times to check in on me, but otherwise I'd been left to my own devices. I mainly slept, but I also read sometimes as well. I had grown used to my shared and overlapping memories, but I was still amazed that I was able to read and think in both English and Russian. While I was still worried about Elena and the others, it all seemed strangely distant now. By the time I'd been there a week, I hardly thought of them at all. It's the hotel, Angelica told me one day when I asked her why I wasn't more scared or worried. I made sure I prefaced it with telling her how much I appreciated her saving my life, but she had just nodded and waved it all away with a laugh as she explained. Not that you shouldn't be happy to be alive and appreciative that we're here to help, but much of your peace is coming from this place. It is very special, she continued. My family has always been very fortunate. We live a very long time and we tend to live very well. But out of all my kin, I was the one blessed with finding Mirror Valley. That's what the locals used to call it, because of the small, still lake that lies at the valley center. It's perfectly round, perfectly calm. It was also the subject of many superstitions and folk tales, as geographic oddities often are. Except this time... Well, this time some of the tales were true. 
I built my hotel on top of that lake more than a hundred years ago, both to be close to its untapped potential and to channel it. This hotel is my temple and my tuning fork. If you'll pardon the clumsy alliteration, it serves as both a monument to my system of belief, the means by which I exert my will in this world and others. She paused here, waiting for me to ask the implied question so she could have the satisfaction of answering it. If I wasn't enraptured by the odd effect of her voice, I might have found it off-putting, but as it was, I just gave her the response she desired. Others. She smiled with the practiced graciousness of someone used to getting what she wanted. Other worlds. So many other worlds. Even in my partial stupor, I had enough sense to wonder why she would tell me all this. I was beyond questioning the reality of incredible things at this point, but I was troubled by her willingness to share such things with a stranger. Unless... You don't plan on letting me leave here, do you? Her smile widened, reminding me of an old gray wolf that used to prowl around my parents' farm when I was a boy. My father would hunt it, but always without success. And I remember one time it stood watching us from the end of the woods, regarding us with a breed of indifferent contempt as my father fruitlessly rushed inside for his rifle. Thinking back on it now, I think that wolf was smiling, perhaps even laughing at us. It understood the terrible truth that we were still learning. You'll never beat me. I'll come when you don't expect it and will always know your tricks better than you know yourself. You should give up. You should give up. You should. Well, I plan on making it so you don't want to leave. Though I suppose that's a thin distinction to you at this point. I want you to stay and make this place your home. I want your help exploring all the many places I found and will find. The workers I have here, they lack the spark I need, but you, I think you could be something very special. The journal entry ended there, except for a short postscript that simply said, when you see her, go with her. I wasn't sure who her was, but the idea that it might be Angelica Lamarck filled my stomach with a queasy, fluttering fear. While I didn't recall those last passages I had read from my own past memory, I did feel I was sharing some of the brain fog he had described. I've heard that some animals, when heading toward their own death and destruction, enter into an almost euphoric state of calm. The lemming tumbling toward the rocks, the mantis feeling the pressure of its deadly lover's embrace. Did they feel fear? or a sense of rightness, a conviction that they weren't being obliterated by bad luck or the ill will of others, but were instead playing their part in the grand design of some larger plan. I stumbled from the train station toward the taxi stand, but was only halfway across the lot when I saw the older woman standing near the taxis watching me. My breath caught in my chest at the sight of her. She was in her fifties now, but still so beautiful that it made my heart hurt. My Lena, here, after all this time. I couldn't say if my fog lifted or just crystallized, but I felt clear-headed and strong as I rushed toward her, sweeping her up in a fierce hug. She laughed at that, but I could feel tension in her too, so after a moment I released her and stepped back. I'm sorry, but... It is you, isn't it? She nodded, tears shining in her eyes as she smiled. It is. I was on the train as well, but I wanted you to have the time to read the pages before we met. We want you to understand as much as you can before you hear the last of it. Did you read it all? I frowned. I did, but I don't know what any of it means. I just... My God, I must... I must be going crazy. I remember you. remember loving you so much, but I also remember my other life in America. 
How is this possible? Alina reached down, touched my cheek tenderly, her joy seeming to give way to an abiding sadness. It is better for him to explain it to you. It's not my story to tell. Come, I have a car nearby. We traveled a few miles to the town of Pripyat, and even at a distance I was amazed by the juxtaposition of the town's ruins with the trappings of tourism. Buses, hotels, and even a few spots selling snacks and souvenirs. It was like watching a party in a graveyard. I guess in some ways that's exactly what it was. But, soon enough we were turning away from the town and heading into the forest between Pripyat and the plant. I could already see security blocking the way a few hundred yards ahead, but before long, Elena was pulling down into the trees with the sure-footedness of long-developed habit. She gave me a quick smile and said we had to walk from there so the car wouldn't get stuck. Before long, we were in a clearing, and in the center of the clearing was the ventilation pipe that Alexi, that I, had written about. I felt only dim surprise when Elena went to it and had opened it easily. Within moments, without any words between us, I was following my lost love down into the dark. The tunnel was nearly pitch black, but when she turned on a flashlight, I saw it was also surprisingly clean and ordinary looking. I wanted to ask so many questions, but something held my tongue. I felt as though I was in a dream and the wrong word or action might break the spell, and although I was afraid of what was to come, but I was more afraid of waking back up in my old life with all that had occurred having been wiped away. I didn't know if that made me crazy or a fool, and frankly, I didn't care. I knew the path I was on was the right path, the important path, and I was going to see it through. Just then, the monster stepped down onto that path. It was just as the journal described, just as I remembered it. Tall and glistening yellow, with flesh stretched painfully and filled with gaping holes that showed the black meat restlessly stirring in its chest. Its eyes, its terrible, purple eyes. I recognized those eyes and that recognition filled me with a kind of terror I'd never known before. Perhaps it was similar to the terrible realization of the limbing, or the man, as he plummets to his death. There are some things you can't take back. I wanted to take it all back as I looked into those eyes, those damned familiar eyes. And then the monster spoke with a deep voice that was coarse, but intelligent. Hello, Brian. Or do you prefer Alexi? I have so little use for names now, it's hard for me to decide. I swallowed, my fear of the monster having been wholly subsumed by what the monster seemed to represent. The inevitability of my own doomed past and future. You're... You're me, aren't you? The thing made a rough, rasping noise that might have been a laugh. Hmm. You're smarter than I am. Or is that even possible? I don't know. I know too much and too little now, I suppose. It swung its head up and down in an approximation of a nod. But yes, I am you. And you are me, after a fashion. I took a step forward, needing to know it all now, needing it to be over. I felt like a man who wanted to vomit, just so the pain and pressure would stop building, even if only for a short while. How is any of this true? And then the monster told me. Angelica called them Delves. Deep excursions into the multitude of worlds that make up what she calls the Incarnata. 
I spent over a decade conducting delves for her, which I soon learned largely meant scouting out places that she could easily exploit in some fashion. It was dangerous, terrifying work, at least at first, but I was almost fully under her spell at that point, and ashamed as I am to admit it, I enjoyed much of the work even from the start. The Incarnata is a place formed from ideas and beliefs and shaped by will and desire. The thousands or millions of worlds that live within it are all interconnected and constantly changing with the ever-shifting tides of its inhabitants' individual and collective thoughts and passions. It literally is, in many ways, a dreamland, though it would be a mistake to think that it was overly chaotic or lacking in substance. To the contrary, what happens there is very real, and much of that power can and does bleed over into our own world as well. It's also a very dangerous place, particularly for visitors. Angelica is a unique in that, for whatever reason, nothing touches her there, good or ill. For all of her candidness, with me on so many matters. She never liked talking about that particular topic, either because she didn't know herself why nothing could affect her, or because she was protective of her greatest strength. Because Angelica, in her own calculating way, is a great conqueror. Between her immunity to most opposition and incarnata and her ability to bend others to her will, she has subjugated several worlds there and enslaved entire groups. She sees them all as monsters, you see. As lesser than her and thus only worth whatever use they have for her greater design. For many years I was part of that design. The risk to Angelica and Incarnata is typically minimal, but her time is limited, and her reputation proceeds over there. It was much easier to send me in her stead, first as an explorer, then as a spy, and eventually as a monster to frighten other monsters. For I don't have any immunity to that place, and there are many places there that can infect you change you. And then there's the fact that you can alter yourself there as well. The more betrayals and atrocities I participated in, the more I hated myself and what I was becoming. But I never stopped. Never refused to do my part for my queen, and with each trip I would come back more warped and twisted in mind and body and soul, growing closer to the abomination you see before us now. My grandmother, our grandmother, always used to say, If you run with wolves, you learn to howl. I thought of that many times as I reflected on what I had become. A creature that was very powerful and knowledgeable, but also very cruel and widely feared, even among fearsome beings. It was during one of these periods of introspection and self-loathing that I began to formulate a plan. I couldn't kill myself. Angelica had too strong a hold on me for that, but perhaps I could kill an earlier version of myself. Time and some aspects of reality have become much more fluid and exploitable for me over the years, and I knew it was possible for me to go back along my own timeline before I found the ball. So that's exactly what I did. In the original timeline of events, I never saw the monster in the woods. The killings and such happened as well as the fake meltdown to cover up the deaths, but they were all related to something else that had escaped the hotel through the bowl, not me coming back to kill my earlier self. When I originally fell into the bowl, it was trying to get away from the guard that had stabbed me, but without any intervention from my monstrous future self. When I came back to 1986, I found my younger self with the hunting party, and I killed those men. Men who I'd once known and called friends without hesitation or pity. The only effects their deaths had upon me was to further demonstrate what a despicable monster I had become. So I approached the younger Alexei with every intent 
on ending his life before he could become the monster that I am. But then I found out I couldn't. Whatever magic Angelica has, it has found a way deep into my bones, so deep in fact that I couldn't do harm to my past self any more than I could my own body. I had a moment of panic, but I've grown exceedingly clever in my own terrible way and quickly saw another solution. When I licked Alexi, I split him in two. Half would stay as he was, following the unassailable path that would lead to a version of me. The other part would become Brian Favors, an infant orphan soon found in another part of the world. My hope at the time was that at the very least I would be sparing at least a portion of my soul from rotting under Angelica's gaze. And it worked after a fashion. I watched the part of me that was still in Pripyat over the next few days, even protecting him from the guard at the end. I would like to say that was due to Angelica's bewitchment, but I don't know that it was. Even after all my efforts to right my wrongs, I'm fearful and selfish, and I know I've become far more like Angelica than I care to admit. But at least there was you. You were living a good life and seemed to be a good person the few times I got to check up on you. But I had to be very careful. You were my one secret from Angelica for the longest time, and then I had another. A few years ago, I managed to trick her, trap her deep within one of the darkest recesses of my incarnata. It freed me and many others from being under her will and allowed me to finally leave the hotel once and for all. I returned here, to the only true home I've ever known. In the years since the Chernobyl plant incident, the bowl isn't visited as much anymore. It's guarded, but never studied or approached more than a handful of times a year. Most of the tunnels connecting its cave to the outside world have been filled with cement, and the few places like this that are left are largely forgotten by the outside world. I'm part of the reason for the forgetting. I'm not seen unless I mean to be seen, and I've made it so people do not remember the bowl much, if at all. My original plan was to just guard the bowl myself and stay in exile until this unnatural form finally died. And then one day I heard Alina praying. She had been evacuated back in 1986, and once the area had been cleared for visitors again, she began making yearly trips back to Pripyat, in part to visit all that had been lost, in part to look for me, despite what logic and her worried family kept telling her. It was on one of these trips that she found her way to the strange ventilation pipe in the clearing above us. She spoke to it like it was my gravestone, telling it how much she still loved me, but she needed to accept I was gone and finally move on. The miracle of hearing her voice joined with my terror at her never coming back, and before I had time to reconsider, I showed myself. It was a terrible ordeal, but not in the way I had anticipated she'd found my first journal, and when I changed the past, I had changed the journal as well. So now she remembered reading about how I encountered the monster and what it looked like. Rather than running from me in fear, she railed against me, demanding to know what I had done with Alexi. It was only when she stopped to look into my eyes and hear me speak that she realized the horrible truth. Somehow, through some miraculous love that I didn't deserve, she had come back to me frequently in those years since. I was more than content with the time she could give, and for a time I thought to live out this part of my life in peaceful solitude while comforted by the life you had so far away from all this death and sorrow. But then I began to feel a troubled stirring in the depths of my bones. She's growing stronger again, somehow in the depths of the Incarnata. I don't know if she's free yet, but if not, it won't be long. 
and despite my best intentions and worst fears, I won't be able to resist her call when it comes. That is why I had Elena send you my journal. That is why I had her deliver my account of my introduction to Angelica in the Imago Hotel. I needed you to remember more, to understand more, so you will not refuse what I have to ask of you. I swallowed. My tongue thick and numb in my mouth. I understood now, and I even believed, but I wasn't sure what I was willing to accept. I was created as an offshoot of a Russian guy by the reality-warping future monster version of the same man. What the actual fuck? Not knowing what to say, I just nodded. The monster swallowed, its slick bulging gorge rising and falling twice as it struggled to meet my gaze. Its next words were almost too quiet to hear. I need you to go with me to the ball. It's empty now, so there's no risk of going to the hotel or anywhere else, but it is the only place close by where I think this will work. Once we are inside, with my help, I need you to consume me, literally eat my body from start to finish. It will not be as long or as daunting a task as you might think. I can ease the work of it greatly, at least until the last, but... It is the only way I can fathom that might finally bring an end to me while also saving you and Helena. I shook my head. What? How does this make any sense? How is me eating you going to help anything? Why can't I just stab it or shoot you or something? Its large eyes grew sadder and I knew it hated what it was asking of me. I felt a pang of sympathy for it. I think this part of Alexei was well-practiced in hating itself. It isn't an act of killing. It is an act of consuming. Absorbing. I will still be in you after a fashion, but this identity, this will, all of that will be ended. You can go on living your life and making your own choices, no longer bound to my mistakes or Angelica. I tried to find a kind way to ask the next part, but any nuance had fled from me somewhere between Kiev and Pripyat. <sighs> Will I become a monster like you? Another rough laugh. <sighs> no. At least I don't think so. But if you learn any lesson from this, let it be this one. I am a monster because of what I've done and let this happen. Not because of how I appear. Some of the best and brightest souls I've ever met were in Incarnata, and yet many would call that place a land of terror and monsters. As for what you will become? Like all of us, that is ultimately up to you. The bowl was much smaller than I remembered, though perhaps that was merely because I was sharing it now. Alina had said her tearful goodbyes to my other self before it climbed under the bowl beside me and she called to me as she would be waiting outside near the car when I was finished. I wanted to ask her to stay, but I knew it was a selfish impulse and so I just told her to be careful as she went. I looked into those eyes one last time and asked it if he was sure this is what he wanted. He said it was. In reaching down, he plucked off a piece of his flesh as though if it were a wad of cotton candy. He offered it to me, and I ate it down with little trouble. I remembered, as a kid, going to a science museum in Kentucky. They had a machine that pumped out a thick fog, and before the teacher came and stopped me, I stood near it and bit at the mist that came pouring out. This is what this was like, eating something that was... Next to nothing. At the end, all that was left was a small and hardened coal that I think had once been his heart. This part had more weight and texture, and as I swallowed down the last of it, I gagged a little at the greasy residue it left behind. 
I waited for a second, tensing for some change, but felt none. All things considered, I felt pretty good. Not wanting to press my luck, I scrabbled back out of the bowl of Pripyat and went up to find Elena waiting. As we traveled away from that doomed town, I found myself feeling a sense of hope I hadn't had in some time. I worried about what he'd said about Angelica returning, about what future dangers the bowl might pose, but those were concerns for another time. Perhaps for other people. For now... I was safe and with the woman I just met and had loved for two lifetimes. Taking her hand, she drove us through the dark. I found that that was enough. <laughs>